Well, hello and welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I have an exciting and interesting podcast for you. Our topic today is the Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide, and our guest expert is Eugene Trufkin. Eugene, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you. It's uh, funny because Eugene was just in HLC3 with me, and he didn't mention that he was the Eugene that wrote this book because I'd been communicating with him by email, and I'd looked at the book before it was published, and him and I had been talking about doing the podcast for some time. So when he pulled into my driveway, I went, that's the same Eugene that was in my class. So I was surprised, and he didn't mention it because he wanted to keep the focus on the class, which was nice of you. Thank you. But I would have loved to have realized it was you. So it was quite a surprise. But uh, it's a beautiful book, Eugene, and um, I'm grateful that you wrote it. This is the kind of information a lot of people need. Um, I have a number of shopping guides in my library, but none of them really isolate out the organic uh, biodynamic, nor do they go into the uh, quite the specific focus as you have in this one. So it's a very unique book. Um, it's lovely that it's it's beautifully illustrated. It's easy to read. Uh, you've got beautiful bullet points for the topics covered in each chapter. It's beautifully illustrated as well, which I think is fantastic. You've got lots of little call-out boxes with misconceptions and keynotes. So uh, I wanted to get you on the podcast and share this book because I think this book should be in everybody's house and it should be in every mother's uh, purse when she goes to the store for their own well-being and their children. So what inspired you to write the Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide, Eugene? Yeah, so basically I was kind of born and raised on an off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine. That's cool. And uh, for your listeners that don't know about uh, what a biodynamic or biodiverse farm is, it's yeah. it's typically what a person has a mental image of in their mind's eye of when they think of kind of farming. Mm -hmm. So they see like a, vi uh, like a wide variety of animals in the farm, a wide variety of crops, yeah. kind of preferably uh, living in a small family unit and a self-sustaining kind of like ecosystem in the in the farm. Yeah. And uh, basically, when I kind of came to the U.S. and for the first time I went to the supermarket, I thought the U.S. mastered organic biodynamic farming when I walked into like a Costco, for instance. Right. I'm like, man, this is why, the U this is why everyone wants to come to the U.S. You know, <laughs> this is why they're an economic superpower because they're able to basically sell like 50 eggs for like a dollar 50 at Costco that are like biodynamic and pasture raised and super organic. And maybe like um, four years ago or so, I ran into uh, like a lecture you're presenting called The Dirt Facts. Yeah. And I ran into it on YouTube. Nutrition, The Dirt Facts. Yeah. yeah. Nutrition, yeah. The Dirt Facts. Yeah. And that's what kind of like opened my eyes and got me to kind of like unplug from like The Matrix, quote right. unquote, The Matrix. And then at that point, I was like, that, that's when I started questioning the food production practices in the U.S. At that point, I was like, man, maybe they're not producing it the same exact way we're producing food on that off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's dramatically different. Yes. And basically, that's where all the confusion actually began. Mm. So, for example, like most people in the U.S. or like in the world in general, they probably don't care about their health that much. But for <laughs> sadly, <laughs> yeah. But for the people that even do care, it's still like extremely, extremely complicated, especially in the U.S. to source high quality food with the tremendous amount of like labeling deception that goes on yes. in the agricultural industry. Yeah. So, for example, let's say a person wants to kind of transform their health and they hire like a dietitian right. to help them out with the nutrition portion of, uh, of their journey. Yes. And that dietitian, among like a couple of other things, tell a couple of other things tells the person, Oh, just make sure, just make sure you're buying grass fed beef. Right. So basically 99% of people are going to take that information and go to the local, local supermarket and find grass fed beef there. Right, and this is the amount of confusion that exists in labeling, even with something as as popular as as grass fed as the grass fed label. Mm -hmm. So, first and foremost, it's important for the listener to understand that all cattle are grass fed. It's impossible to feed grain to cattle their entire life and keep them alive. Right. 
So whenever you see the grass-fed label, it really doesn't say too much. No. Because a, a, a popular understanding is like, okay, it's grass-fed, but it's grain-finished. Right. So in this case, it's important for listener to know that the cattle, their species-specific diet is more in tune with that of a herbivore. Mm -hmm. Like typically, they're going to be eating grass their entire life, ideally, mm -hmm. and other forage as well. But what happens in most production practices is like, for instance, cattle are, let's say in a two year production cycle or an 18 months of production cycle, for the most part, they're gonna be on pasture eating grass for a large portion of their life. But the bulk majority of that cattle is gonna be sent to a feedlot where they're fed nothing but grains right. for the last few months before they're harvested or sent to a slaughterhouse, for example. Mm -hmm. And that short period of time where they're fed that grain, it changes the nutritional profile of the meat quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes this person that wants to change their health will go to the supermarket, they'll see that grass-fed label, which is not regulated at all by anybody, and they'll continue to buy that meat pretty much for their whole entire life and not, not uh, question it whatsoever. But the problem with feeding like a non-species specific diet to an animal like cattle, for example, is oftentimes if it's heavily supplemented with grain, it's going to ruin the natural balance of omega-3 to omega-6, yeah. causing kind of like a pro-inflammatory effect in the person that continues to eat that meat. Yeah. And um, you can touch on it in a lot more detail, but a person can look up the inflammation theory of disease and they'll see that the bulk majority of diseases arise from low-grade chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So once again, this person's intention is to optimize their health. Yeah. They're buying this grass-fed meat, thinking that is what it's doing, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's kind of most likely grain-finished. Yes. And sometimes people, I give grocery store tours to people that are interested in losing body fat, and mm -hmm. I try to teach them about the food production practices there. And sometimes they'll go like, oh, like I buy grass-fed and grass-finished beef. Right. And this is another huge uh, deception going on here, because oftentimes what happens is the cattle would be once again fed grass, let's say for the first like 10 months of their life or something then fed grain for a couple months and then finished for about like a week on grass mm. and they'll still label it grass fed and grass finished. Yeah. And then once again, the person is buying that meat, trusting the label, thinking it's giving them the health benefits. And mm -hmm. it might be healthier, for instance, than eating like uh, processed food and stuff like that, but it's definitely not optimizing the nutritional profile mm -hmm. of the food group. Yeah. And then to make it even more complicated, sometimes people go like, oh, but it says 100% grass fed. Mm -hmm. But I could easily be a rancher and finish my cattle on grass pellets or hay in a feedlot. Mm -hmm. That actually happened to me. Like I, I was buying 100% grass fed beef for about like a year from a very popular organic local supermarket uh, here in Southern California. And then one day I decided to give the company a call. And they're honest. They're like, yeah, we do. They are raised on pasture, but then we set them to a feedlot and feed them grass pellets for like the last few months. Right. And so that kind of like just basically summarizes the, the level of confusion uh, that goes on with even just the grass-fed label. Mm -hmm. And also to make it like a little bit more complicated, the U.S. actually imports about 90% of its uh, grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. So most of it isn't even actually produced in the U.S. So now you have mm -hmm. like a, a few problems because depending on where it's, it's uh, imported from, I mean, a lot of times those countries don't even have th the amount of resources to even combat like serious crime in their country. Moreover, mm -hmm. go after farms for like slight irregulations yeah. on like, oh, did you feed them any grain? Did you make sure to yeah. feed them grass 100% of the time, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera, so... There's also the issue of the quality of the grass and whether or not that grass is organic. And um, just because an animal's grass fed doesn't mean that it's healthy, um, even if it's free range. If you're free range and you're walking around in a sea of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, chemical fertilizers, um, you know, uh, years ago I read a book that said on average an animal. Uh, makes one pound of meat for every six pounds of, of vegetable matter it consumes. Um, now that could range from animal to animal, but I think they were just giving a general um, estimate. But that's a lot of bioaccumulation of toxins, you know. And the other thing is, is where did this? What quality of the grass is the pellets, and where did they come from? And then the other issue too that 
I've read a lot about over the years is that when they grain finish cattle, then it pr uh, produces huge amounts of acidity in their body. It shifts their body extremely acid, which again makes them sick. And also uh, high levels of acidity set uh, an any organism up for parasite infections. So you get uh, all these animals that are being fed incorrectly, which makes them very sick, which of course leads to lots of antibiotics and various drugs to literally keep them alive. And I've seen many videos showing them pulling dead cows out of the uh, out of the pens that they they put them in for the uh, grain fed portion of it because the the animals are so sick they're just dying. Yep, exactly. So there's a lot of uh, complicated stuff going on that, as you're mentioning, goes below the radar of public awareness. And it's interesting too when you when you look at what you know. When I did my research, I got the entire USDA organic um, document from the government, which was hundreds of pages. I mean, this thing was a huge pile of paper sitting on my desk. It took me months to go through it all. And I was amazed at all the deception that they had in that thing, too. I mean, you, you start looking at things like, um, you know, things like cupcakes and cakes can be called certified organic as long as it's 70 percent organic well when you think of like okay well they can put 30 percent of whatever they want in there and still call it organic well how much mercury is safe how much pesticides herbicides fungicides redenticides uh, glyphosate is safe they don't even measure stuff like that and and i saw you know lists of ingredients that were put into these things that were the opposite of organic and they have all sorts of qualification criteria that until you read the actual document you would have no idea you, you know the typical person buying thinks oh i'm getting organic food it's nice and clean and the usda certification is probably one of the better ones out there i found the gold standard worldwide is the demeter association are you familiar with them? Yep. And I actually, surprisingly, I was in Germany like about uh, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to see that actually the bulk majority of their supermarkets, like maybe 20% of the produce was Demeter certified. That's great. Yeah. So you kind of like never, never see that in any supermarket in the US pretty no. much. So No, but I use that when my students ask me, well, what's the, what, what do we kind of compare it to? I say, well, Demeter is, is the best one I could find. And the other thing, too, as I've mentioned in my classes and my lectures on this, um, you know, today there's over 100 organic certifications, most of which are owned by corporations like Pepsi Cola, Mars Bar, Snickers, Cadbury, um, uh, you got uh, uh, all sorts of soda pop companies, candy companies, um, I can't remember them all, Kellogg's. I mean, people that you would never, ever think would have an organic certification. But when I looked into this, one of the key features that I found is any real organic certification ha requires that there's a two-year gestation period where you have to farm organically, and they test your soil to see what impurities in it, what chemicals are in it. And they won't give you your organic certification until you pass their soil test. So if it takes two years or five years, it doesn't matter. But the key thing about a real organic certification is you can't actually get your certification to label your food certified organic until you've passed their, their final soil analysis. But of the hundred or so out there, I think there's only probably four or five, if you're lucky, that actually require soil testing. The, all the other ones have to do is pay a fee. You just pay a fee and you label your food organic. And so it, it's it's just, it's sad for me because we, it, we've, it would be like the equivalent of saying you can become a medical doctor by taking a correspondence course and nobody's going to evaluate whether or not you can do surgery or you know how to prescribe drugs. And all of a sudden, everyone's wondering why so many people are dying at the hands of medical doctors. Not that that's not already a problem, but... Um, you know, w people have a tendency to not realize how critical food is to their well-being. Our culture uh, has gotten into this habit of thinking of food like energy and energy alone, the way they buy gasoline and shop for gasoline. 
but they don't realize that food is not just energy, it's information. And whenever you add chemicals or a cow or an animal eats things that aren't designed for it, you're bringing information into the system that confuses the system. So you feed cows grain. They're not designed to eat grain. It acidifies their body. It's not a food they can eat. It inflames their digestive tract, gives them, you go to the feedlots and you go to these, I've been to many of them. Most of these animals have bad diarrhea. You see diarrhea all over the place because they're sick. And so when when we realize that we're the food we eat provides information that our cellular systems, our glands, our organs, and our tissues use to recreate themselves. If that information is confused, it's kind of like having a virus in a computer system. You can't put the wrong information into software or it'll, or it'll completely screw up your computer. And so one of the big challenges is that because people continue to see food as energy and not as information and not realizing the concept of biocompatibility, they end up spending tons of money running to doctors and therapists 